Hello, my name is Giles Brandreth. I'm Susie Dent. And did you know, Susie, that this Brandreth is a word, it's in the dictionary, B-R-A-N-D-R-E-T-H. And when I looked it up last, I think the definition of a Brandreth was a substructure of piles. <laughs> Is dent in the dictionary? Uh, dent, oh yes, dent's in the dictionary. I, and in no way is it a good uh, a good word in the dictionary, I think. It's always about bashes and, you know, having your um, ego dented. Or it, it probably actually goes back to French um, conquerors, so Anglo-Norman conquerors who had funny teeth. So you think about dent in French and the dent, uh, they probably had some kind of prominent tooth work going on. So the dent, as it were, when your car is bashed into, there's a dent, is the same sort of dent as dentist, dentistry? Well... Dental? Is it the same origin? Mm, possibly. I mean, there's a topographical element there too. So de there's dent in Yorkshire. So it could be that I've got Yorkshire roots. I tend to go for that one rather than the, and you know... the Brandreth is a hill in Yorkshire. Well, there you go. So we're a couple of hills... I've been called a hillock or something quite <laughs> approaching it in my time. Uh, so we're a couple of Yorkshire hills, yes. also words in the dictionary, and we are old friends. When did we first meet? I don't think I've been doing Countdown very long, and I have now been doing Countdown for 26 years, so wow. a long time ago. Gosh, how long, were you, how long have you been doing Countdown? I began doing Countdown when it began. Yes. Countdown, for people who are listening to our podcast and don't know it, it's a, uh, it's a TV show in Britain uh, and it's been running since 1982. Mm -hmm. Susie sits in a corner of the studio and has access to the Oxford English Dictionary where you work. Uh, I don't actually work there anymore. Um, so I now do count down full time. You? Yes, I was one of many people who uh, sat in the corner and then was booted out, and another one came along. And essentially, we judge the words that the contestants come up with and try to come up with the longest words from nine letters that we can as well. So it's fairly full on for the 30 seconds of the famous countdown clock. This is Something Rhymes with Purple. We're going to talk about words and language and the importance of words and language. And we both of us, I think, love language. I love language because my parents loved words and language, but I've become a sort of passionate about it because I've realized as the years go by that language is power. Language is what defines us. It's really what makes us human. You can do marvelous things with a hug. You can send a warm message with an emoji, but somehow you need words to really communicate. The famous philosopher Bertrand Russell said, no matter how eloquently a dog may bark, he cannot tell you that his parents were poor but honest. <laughs> Only words can do that. And in my experience, words make all the difference. Words give you a happier life, a healthier life. Being able to use the language, I say, people say to me, a healthier life, and I say yes, because the research shows that if you can communicate more clearly, you can communicate to your doctor more clearly, nurses more clearly and you can understand what they're saying you actually can look after yourself better you'll be more successful in life and in love words are everything think Cyrano de Bergerac oh the he knows great words love of his life Cyrano de Bergerac one of my favorite plays favorite movies who is the French actor in the movie? Gérard Depardieu. Gérard Depardieu with the enormous conch. <laughs> what is the origin of the word conch? That is a very good question. I know it's dialect and uh, I have no idea. It may be related to conkers, do you reckon? I don't know. Or, oh, well, I uh, should know. Actually, and you can look that up. I'm going to look so it up. The idea of this podcast is that we're going to talk about words in different ways, shapes, forms uh, around the world. And we're going to share with you the origin of some words when we come across them, words like conk. But we're also, I think, I hope, going to show you ways in which, if you're interested, you can increase your word power. Mm. Uh, can you give me conk? Okay. I have the wonderful OED online in front of me. Conk, the nose. It says, possibly related to conquer, it is slang. I don't think they've completely nailed the origin down, but it says, possibly a figurative application of conch. And that's a shell, of course. And the first conkers in the conquer game were actually uh, played with shells of, of mollusks rather than the horse chestnut fruit that we know today. So that's where conkers come from as well. Well, listen to this podcast. You will live and learn. <laughs> and then, of course, you'll die and forget it all. But in the interim, we hope you will find it quite amusing. Susie, why are words important to you? 
Words have always been important to me, but I actually can't give you a reason because it's so instinctive for me. And um, I always tell the story of when I was sitting in the bath as a, pretty much as a toddler, I think. Maybe I was about three, uh, maybe maybe a tiny bit older, and just marvelling at shampoo bottles, sitting on the side of the bath, noticing that the ingredients were written in different scripts, scripts that I couldn't decipher at all. But I remember seeing the different shapes and marvelling at the fact that there were children across the world who would be able to understand one of those lines but not the other, so that there were different things going on in um, in people's brains I guess uh, obviously my thought pattern was not so sophisticated when I was uh, that young but just just marveling at the shape of words and uh, the differences between them and from then on in I just became very nerdy indeed and would sit in the back of the car reading vocabulary books but first it was French and German that really really got to me first it was foreign languages um, and I would sit in the back of the car my sister would be playing around with eyelash curlers I would be literally absorbing as much vocabulary as I could. But I honestly can't tell you why, except they thrilled me and they still do. I think I was introduced to words by my parents, both of whom had a love of words. My mother was a teacher and she was a remedial uh, English teacher. And so she loved language and communicating that way. My father was a lawyer an old mm. school lawyer, born in 1910. Mm -hmm. So he was virtually an Edwardian. And he, he loved telling stories about old school lawyers. And my father was brought up in uh, near Liverpool. Uh, and the famous, when he was young, the famous barrister in that part of the world was a man called F.E. Smith. Have mm -hmm. you heard of him? No. He became the first Earl of Birkenhead. He was Lord Chancellor, very, very, very famous barrister. And he was in court one day pointing at the accused and said to the accused, or rather said to the jury, um, at the time of the alleged offence, uh, the accused, the time of the alleged offence, the accused was drunk as a judge. At which point the judge intervened to say, uh, I think you'll find, Mr Smith, the expression is drunk as a lord. <laughs> as your lordship pleases. And the play on words, I, I remember <laughs> hearing this when I was a little boy and thinking, oh, it's so clever. And so I loved the fun you could have with language. I have to just uh, interpolate uh, something there, which is, you know, drunk as a lord. You know, uh, the swear word bloody, and I know we're going to devote an entire podcast, actually, to swearing, but... Yeah, um, look forward to that, chaps. Yee! <laughs> <laughs> it used to be drunk as a blood, blood being kind of rowdy aristocrats in oh. the 18th centuries. Uh, he would go out and paint the town red, sometimes literally, and um, they were the bloods. They were the aristocrats. They were those with the supposedly good blood. Um, and and so drunk as a blood became bloody drunk. And bloody, our swear word, actually isn't, we think, anything. It hasn't anything to do with the blood of Mary Christ. or Christ, but everything to do with those aristocratic rowdies and hooligans who were known as bloods. They were so, bloody drunk. I always thought it was by our Lord's blood. Yeah, no. Nothing to do with that at all. No, not as far as we can tell. This is an educational <laughs> podcast. Do not be put off by that. It's incidental learning. How amazing. Yeah. Painting the town red, where does that come from? Well, those in Melton Mowbray would say that it did come from those bloody drunks who literally took a sort of can of paint and uh, just graffitied with that red paint um, all, the, all the walls, I think, walls of the theatre, etc. Um, we know that that incident did take place not quite sure. And one of the things that we will talk about lots, I think, in the course of our podcast is the fact that we can't always nail down the sort of tricky, the tricky origins. And we have to be word detectives always. And that work is ongoing. But anyway, the, the dates don't quite fit of that episode and the first records that we have of being uh, of painting the town red. But who knows? Sometime the link may be uh, may be found. But as I say, we're, we're just digging all the time. We're kind of archaeologists as well as detectives. Let's then begin at the beginning. We are speaking in the English language. Mm -hmm. Am I right in saying it is perhaps the richest language in the world? Hmm. Well, that's what up for that debate, mean? isn't mm. it? Um, there's a famous quote, I think it might be Goethe, possibly, who talks about English being um, a country garden, so you can sort of wander at, you know, at your will, that French is like a, a sort of noble park, um, very organised, um, quite sort of purist, I suppose, and that German is a deep, dark wood that you can get completely lost in. So me being um, a Germanist, I love German. It's we, just, for me, 
it's the greatest love of my life. And that will surprise you because I adore English. But for me, German is the one that really, really has it. I would kind of agree with that. You can get entirely lost with German. I know it has a bad rap all the time. Um, but so can you get lost in English. And, and part of the thing I really want to do is bring back some of the joys of English that I think we've lost a little bit over time. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that uh, the English language was a great river into which so many tributaries have flowed. Well, that's true. And maybe the difference between French and English is that French has attempted to stay pure, it has attempted to be this rather refined garden you spoke of, like yeah. the gardens of Versailles, yeah. whereas ours is more rambling and open to... Because we've accepted words, whereas the French actually have a system, don't they, where they try to keep foreign words out of the language. Yes, well, they have an academy. We have always resisted an academy. So they have a, a, a sort of legal authority who can dictate and preside over language. Um, I have to say it's a bit of a losing battle. I mean, you know, as everyone knows, the French use um, English words, whether it's le weekend or le sandwich, uh, all the time. We have, although some people have wanted it over, over the centuries, we have always thankfully resisted it. And I think that is why English is as robust um, as it is today. But we haven't just accepted words. We have gone out and, you know, hoovered them up actively. We have plundered words from every single continent we've encountered. So it's been quite aggressive as well as accepting. In Webster's, I think, the big American dictionary now, in the biggest volume, there are 500,000 words, whereas in the French equivalent, there are 100,000 words. Mm. So it's 20% the French language of the English language at its most generous. And as you say, that 20% includes le weekend, le snack bar, le feel good factor, <laughs> le Brexit. I should just say uh, that, of course, the, the sort of, we have no authority. So when people say to me, um, can I have this word? Not in countdown, because obviously we have to have an arbiter there and there. It is the Oxford Dictionary and what's in there is what you can have. But outside, in the general world, people will often say to me, mm, is that a word? And the answer I always give is, yes, if you want it to be, because any word is a word. You know, we can we can all make up a word and it exists. It's all, when it comes to the dictionary, it's all about democracy, it's all about usage. And for a word to go in, it has to be used often enough. Um, and that has to be evidenced in lots of different places and we can go into that. But, you know, language is as elastic and as, as liberal as you want it to be. So anything can be a word. It's, it's constantly possible. evolving. It is. How has it evolved? What were we speaking a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago? Well, it's such a complicated story, really, because as you say, English is an amalgam of so many different influences. But we probably start with um, Old English. So Old English um, displacing um, the, the language of the Celts, um, which I have to say their language survives in very, very few words. It's quite surprising how dramatic those invading Germanic tribes, the Angles and the Saxons were. Well, what's the oldest word we're currently using? What's the oldest yeah. word around? Well, if you look at Celtic words, you'll find them in place names like Tor and Pen and things like that. So um, they would be very good contenders. Um, but then, of course, you've got, and I'm going to get really nerdy here, you've got um, the ultimate ancestor of English, which is something called Proto-Indo-European. Mm -hmm. Now, that is an ancient, ancient language that gave us so many different languages. So sort of um, all the Romance languages will, it will descend from this Proto-Indo-European. And we shouldn't get into that because it is incredibly complicated. But that's our sort of ultimate um sort of forebear if you like um, but then we have Old English and then uh, quite soon uh, after we have the Vikings of course so the Vikings came they plundered um, they were savage as we know although after a while they did coexist quite happily with um, with the natives and so English and Old Norse the, the language of the Vikings sort of coexisted quite happily and then you know, as will always happen, the, uh, you know, one of them will kind of gain supremacy. And Viking words we can see in so many fantastic vocabulary items today. So we've got um, the obvious ones like ransack. Um, but we've got quite cute ones like freckle. Um, we have husband. We have dagger and knife and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, quite often it was the sort of language of aggression, but quite often it was just, as I say, the language that was earthy and rich um, and came from their Scandinavian heritage. So, you know, already you've got all these things going on. And then we had another huge conquest, of course, at 1066 when William was made king, he spoke in Latin and French. He didn't speak a word of English. The Normans flooded English with their aristocratic French. Oh, and So it's William the Conqueror conquered the language as well. Oh, He so did much. not speak the Celt. The language. No, not at all. He did not speak as Vikings spoke. 
nor the Anglo-Saxons, no. And so he brought what languages you there? French? He brought French. And Latin. And, and Latin. Um, and we, again, sort of adapted. So we came up with something, which is a sort of strange hybrid called Anglo-Norman. Um, so we're going to talk about spelling, I know, um, uh, at some point. But quite a lot of the weird spellings that we have today go back to that kind of other strange hybrid of, of French and English. And I'm right in thinking that people who are interested in oratory, like Winston Churchill, would always recommend the Anglo-Saxon language over the French and Latin language, so that blood, toil, tears and sweat, these are old Anglo-Saxon terms, whereas blood would be sanguinary in the Latin or French version. Toil would be labour, as in laborious, from the Latin labor. Mm. So that if you want to speak directly to people, you should use Anglo-Saxon. That's absolutely right. And uh, it's all about register, isn't it? You want to be formal? Choose the French. Want to be earthy, plain speaking? Choose the Anglo-Saxon. Um, and Is that why French was the language of diplomacy for so French many years? French was the language of diplomacy, French French was the language of aristocratic pursuits. Uh, so quite a lot of our um, sort of everyday vocabulary items come, for example, from falconry. So if we talk about an old codger, the codger was the cadger. He was the person who actually worked with the falconer and held or caught the um, the hawks. Um, they, they were haggard hawks, haggard going back to a wild, untamed hawk. That was the first meaning of that. Um, allure was the um, was the leash that the, fal- the, the hawk was kept on. Um, and so it goes on. All these aristocratic pursuits. I mean, we now know the well-known um, fact that um, it was the, uh, the the sort of English peasants, if you like, who looked after the cows and the sheep and the pigs. And it was the French elite who ate the results. So um, cows, pigs, sheep, all Anglo-Saxon words. Pork, beef, muffin, uh, muffin, mutton, etc. Well, come on to muffin. That's another episode. <laughs> I think you'll enjoy it. They, uh, they're all French words. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's a very well-known fact, but it absolutely highlights uh, who had the power in those days. How do words nowadays get into the language? It's evolved over thousands of years. You mentioned, you said you were a bit nerdy. Mm. I happen to know, I hope I'm right in this, that the word nerd originates from a story by Dr. Zeus, mm-hmm. Dr. Zeus, yes. the American writer, died not long ago, children's writer. Yeah, I'm an ex- he wrote a story mm-hmm. in the 1950s that had a character called Nerd. Yes. Who had nerdish qualities. Slightly nerdy qualities. And um, quite what the journey was from there, we're not sure. I actually, do you know what? I shouldn't have used the word journey. I hate it when people talk about journeys these days. But anyway. Oh, I can't bear it. You're right. When we get on to it, nuanced is another one. Ugh. It used to be a nice word. Yes. But now it's so overused. I agree. But I'm liking your nuanced answers as you go on this journey. Okay, good. Thank you. And while we're on nerds, um, yes. I'm also a geek. Uh, who knows? What's cooler? I think a geek is cooler than a nerd, personally. So I probably should call myself a geek. Um, but geeks originally were performers at freak shows. And they were the sort of assistants sometimes to the charlatans, but also the the sort of people who would do weird acts on stage, but slightly obsessive acts, slightly extreme acts. So they would um, bite the heads off live chickens and eat them in front of their audience. It's awful. It goes back to a dialect word, geck, meaning fool or simpleton. And then it became somebody who was extremely obsessive. That oh, really? and gull, that, uh, the, uh, where I played Malvolio, the part in Twelfth Night, oh, and I yeah. remember you've made me the most notorious geck and gull. There you go. Yes, that's and a fool and a dupe. And yep. that's the original of geek. Geek. Comes from geck. Comes from geck. Oh, we are learning a lot. <laughs> I made a list the other day of new words um, based on Brexit. Because I came across, obviously, Brexit, somebody, I read somewhere that Brexit was the fastest moving um, new word of our time, mm. in the sense that it had gone around the world more quickly. Blog may have been a word that has gone further than mm-hmm. Brexit, but Brexit more rapidly went around the world, than that, which seems possible. Mm-hmm. And clearly it goes into the dictionary because it's in newspapers. And Brexit is a modern new word, wasn't heard of ten years ago, but here it is, everybody now is using it around the world. It's what's called a portmanteau word. It is. From Lewis Carroll, that word? Lewis Carroll was somebody who liked putting two words into one basket. He did. portmanteau being a a Victorian carrying case. Yes, two two sides. Mm -hmm. Oh, oh, it had two sides to it. Two sides, yes. So you opened it out, you put things on either side, put it together, and you have the blend, which we also... Uh, and Lewis Carroll wrote words. Alice in Wonderland came up with such portmanteau words as... Chortle. Chortle, which Chuckle was... Chuckle and snort. Very good. Love that. Mimsy. 
Mimsy, which was what? Mimsy. Mimsy was flimsy and... Mm. That's in Jabberwocky, isn't it? While you're checking it, because she's, <laughs> she's able to cheat, can I tell you? I am cheating, big people. time. She has actually got her um, apple, which used to be, when I was a boy, it was just a fruit. Now it seems to be a machine. Um, anyway, what, what does Mimsy come okay, on? OK, let's give you Mimsy. It's definitely flimsy and what do you reckon? I know Galumph comes oh. from um, Gallop and Triumph. Gallop and Triumph. And actually, the meanings change a little bit because, yes, he for him it was triumphantly galloping and for us it's more like a galumph to yeah. the kettle this morning. Miserable and flimsy. Miserable and flimsy. Yeah. Log comes from Web and Log. Yeah. Do you know what Botox comes from? Because I don't know why anyone would have Botox if they knew what the origin of the word was. Botulinum My... toxin. Botulism and toxin, you're right. Yeah. But botulism doesn't sound very nice, and toxin is a kind of poison, what? isn't it? Botulism is actually related to um, pudding, believe it or not, because the word pudding, you know all the puddings in um, olden days, um, if you saw one on Henry VIII's table, it would definitely be a savoury pudding, um, like a steak pudding, something like that. And uh, they were known as boudin, and ultimately it goes back to the Roman botulus, meaning sausage. <laughs> so there you go. So it's like having a sausage pushing your forehead. <laughs> I go to the dentist now yes. and to have my teeth checked, yes. and the man is trying to flog me Botox. <laughs> that's what that's what Talk it's to coming to. Talk to me about sausages. Uh, and please, I don't know where that would end up. <laughs> but anyway, so I'll give you one more, a okay. few more of these. Biopic. Do you pronounce that biopic? Well, that's a big debate. Oh. Um, yes, it should be biopic. Everybody talks about biopics. Yeah, biopic. but it's biography and a, a picture, isn't it? Yes. Bootylicious. Bootylicious, uh, booty and delicious. Britpop, bromance, I quite like that. Mm -hmm. um, Portman Bros, they're called. Bruce Ploitation. Do you know that one? Bruce. Bruce Lee and Exploitation. Movies that are Bruce. Bruce. <laughs> Bruce Ploitation. What a mouthful. Yeah, no one's exactly. ever going to use that. Uh, Bonoffi, as in Bonoffi Pie. Oh, yes, Banana and Toffee. Love that. Yeah. Burkini. Burkini, Burko and Burkini. Yeah. So these, the. the, the Actually, one of the interesting ones, I think, is um, brunch. I love brunch. Yes, that's one of the really early ones. 1897, I think. All right. Very nice. People come up with new words. How do they get into the dictionary? Right. Well, contrary to uh, belief, um, you can't petition for a new word to go in the dictionary. So we had, when I worked at um, Oxford University Press, when I was working on the dictionary, we had um, protesters, for example, one day um, from the um, British Potato Council, I think it was. And they really objected to the use of couch potato because they thought it was um, defamatory to the potato. So it was very unfair to the poor potato uh, because they said, you know, it, it kind of encouraged the idea that potatoes cause you to be fat and therefore lazy. Uh, so they wanted couch slouch instead. Uh, that didn't really work. Um, then, of course, we had McJob and McDonald's um, very vehemently objecting to the McJob when it went into the dictionary, which at that time was a sort of uh, poorly paid, um, you know, sort of bottom of the rung job. But it hasn't what? stood the test of time. It actually, no, because I think they've made big efforts to improve their um, but employment. But it should, in my view, it should still be in the dictionary because let's say you're reading a novel. Mm. A bit of trick lit published in the eighteen, uh, forgive me, the nineteen nineties mm. might include the word McJob. You wouldn't know what yeah. it was. You're reading it in twenty twenty, and you actually want to look it up. So would yeah. McJob still be there I to help you through understanding? The thing about the Oxford English Dictionary, the wonderful historical Oxford English Dictionary, is once a word goes in, it never comes out. So famously, the dictionary makers, the dictionary compilers at the Oxford English Dictionary are very careful about what they allow in. So a word has to have shown some longevity, um, has to have proved itself really before it will go in. On the other hand, there's another team of wonderful people who work on the current English dictionaries at Oxford. And what they do is they study vast databases of English. Now, they go by a really boring name called um, corpora plural of corpus and uh, a corpus is actually really exciting I promise you so essentially you're looking at words in action in use from novels blogs transcripts of text conversations scholarly journals newspapers you name it any kind of source of language of English language that you can think of will go into an English language corpus and from that we're able to see which words go with the word that you're particularly looking at so what if it, what are its companions its normal companions um, what, how often it's being used, of course, uh, where it's being used, um, whether it's inform, whether it's slang, whether it's more formal, etc. So we can d 
deduce all of this from these wonderful corpora. And I was thinking about this the other day, for example, because I was talking to a German speaker and she was using she's ambitious, those two words, or those three words, um, in a very positive way. She's ambitious. And what she wasn't getting is the nuance, sorry, I hate that word, that you will pick up in a corpus where if if you and I were to say, oh, she's ambitious, mm. there's a slight edge to it. Mm. Very unfairly, I have to say, because you might not think that of, of a man. But um, there is an edge, isn't there? And mm. you will be able to pick that up from this corpus because you'll see all sorts of examples. So if a word is used often enough, then it will uh, be put down as a candidate for uh, the dictionary. So as I said before, it's all about democracy. It's all about usage. And the dictionary makers are not judgmental. I you knew many years ago a man called Robert Birchfield. Yes. Who was a very distinguished editor of I the Oxford Dictionary. I met him once too. Lovely man. And I worked with him when, when I was young, because I'm a bit older than you. <laughs> a lot older than you. Anyway, uh, and he had a terrible time because people in the Jewish community were objecting to definitions given to the word Jew and Jewish mm. in the dictionary. Mm. And he was trying to explain to them that the dictionary simply records the way this word has been used. Mm. That doesn't mean to say we approve of the use of it. We are recording the use of it. Yes. But I imagine that's problems you get all the time. Very much so. So I remember when I first started, people objecting to Welshing on someone, you know, the idea of that. And actually, that's sort of... What does Welshing mean? Welshing mean re means reneging kind of, on... You're just cheating. Cheating. Really, yes. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the sort of use of Welsh in that um, context has, has been going on for centuries. It doesn't make it right. Um, so, for example, using a Welsh comb means you haven't used a comb. You've just used your fingers and your hair looks a mess. Um, and lots and lots of examples like that. But as you say, we are... Famously, what we will say is we are descriptive. We aren't prescriptive. It wasn't always the case. So Samuel Johnson, when he set out to make his dictionary, he wanted to freeze English. He wanted to stop it um, or, or kind of uh, preserve it, if you like, before it went to the dogs because he already saw slang infiltrating the language and, um, you know, mucking it up, making it all sort of dirty. So that's what he wanted to do when he set out. In the course of writing his wonderful dictionary, even though he was looking at the language of the greats and the classics, etc., he realised that he couldn't preserve it, that it was a futile task. And he used a wonderful phrase, which is, to enchain syllables is as futile as lashing the wind. Oh, Isn't that beautiful? I must just tell people, if you're still listening, there'll be lots of these podcasts on a regular <laughs> basis. I am guaranteeing that we will do one from Dr Johnson's house in Gough Square oh, yes, in London off Fleet Street, where some of his books still exist, where we can touch his DNA. Yes. Dr Johnson was a, a lexicographer and a writer around 1720, that sort of period. Yes, 1756 was... Oh, 1765 was uh, his dictionary. Thank you, it's yeah. a little bit later than I thought. So yeah. we will be going to Dr Johnson's house. I want to go to the birthplace of Noah Webster. Oh, yes. Because we are international, we are global. And yes. Noah Webster is the man who defined the American language as opposed to the English language. Yes. I don't know where he came from. Somewhere in New England, I bet. So we're going to get to New England. It's too exciting. But <laughs> well, we've got to go for today because I've got to go to a, a host an award ceremony. Oh. You mentioned the Potato Council. Yes. I once uh, I once hosted the British Potato Awards. Amazing. Yeah, I hope you was, didn't talk about couch potatoes. I didn't talk about couch potatoes. <laughs> not one in the eye. No spud you like jokes. None of that. They took it quite seriously. <laughs> yeah. I, I do a lot of that sort of thing. I Then, most recently, I did the Epic Awards, E-P-I-C, the Epic yeah. Awards, the Egg and Poultry Industry Council Award. But the one I'm doing... Yes. Tonight is the British Funeral Directors Awards. Ah, oh, okay. Third year running. Black humour. No black humour. Okay. They're lovely people. I it's bet. a very necessary service. Of course. Uh, can't be said they don't enjoy a cold winter um, <laughs> because it is good for business. <laughs> but they've got a sense of humour. The two big prizes at the end of the evening one is for the lifetime achievement, that's for thinking outside the box. <laughs> And the other, I knew this was coming. And the other <laughs> is the for the crematorium of the year, the creme de la creme. Oh, now, we have to talk about death at some point in our journey together. I'm using journey again there. We, um, I want to because it's really important. And actually, in the Middle Ages, they talked about death all the time. Why are we so scared of it now? We'll have a podcast on death. Oh, Susie, before you go, you know more words than I do. I know quite a few words. How many words do you think we know? How many? Somebody listening to this who, you know, went to uni, went to school, uh, speaks English, how many words will they have in their vocabulary, roughly? Mm, it depends. I would say if you have 100,000 words at your disposal, you're doing really well. Shakespeare only had between thirty and 50,000, and look what he did with them. Yeah, there we are. So it's not the words you know, it's the way you use them. You use them amazingly. And you want, through our podcast, to encourage people 
to increase their vocabulary, to grow their vocabulary. And what trio of words have you brought for us today? I'm going to give you a threesome of Bs today. Ooh, I'm not going to start with the A's, but just Bs. And they won't always be um, uh, alphabetical. But um, these are all words that were once in um, a dictionary. It could be a dialect dictionary, so it could be a local glossary from Yorkshire, or it could be in the wonderful OED, the wonderful Oxford. And you're just going to give us what the word is, and shall I guess the definition? Or just gonna Okay, yes, the this, this is going to be fun, this one. Right, I'm going to start with a phrase, actually, bang a bonk. Oh, I like it. You should have finished <laughs> on that one. Bang a bonk. Yeah. Hey, I love it. I'm writing this down. Bang a bonk. This is old dialect for sitting lazily on a riverbank. That gorgeous. That's gorgeous, but I can tell you it's bound to be misunderstood. When of I course, go home and say to my it. darling wife, shall we bang a bonk this afternoon? <laughs> She'll beef me on the nose. I don't want to be there at the time. Um, OK, uh, another B for you. Um, now, this is, I'm not looking at you, Giles. Bloviator. A bloviator. Yeah. I don't know. This is somebody who goes up flying in an aeroplane without having had the eye test. <laughs> a bloviator. A bloviator. Or a bloviator, you could pronounce it. That might give you a bit more of a hint. A bloviator? It's a, it's a braggart or a blower of hot air. As in blowing. And, I mean... Ye uh, yes, bloviating is... Um, actually, it goes back to Latin roots. It's not really anything to do with blowing, but if you pronounce it bloviator, it will bloviator, it be an idea. Bloviator, and that's a braggart, a boaster. Yes. Or somebody full of hot air. Yes. Full of hot air. I'm writing these down. Yeah. Um, and I just love the sound of this one. And um, I'm hoping that um, hopefully we've had one or two today um, from you. And uh, also hopefully we'll have a few in our future podcast. Boffalers, a boffala. A boffala? Is that a kind of cheese? No, nothing to do with mozzarella. It's an uproariously funny joke. A boffala? Yes. Is an up <laughs> well, it makes look, your sides shake. That's the idea. I think it's fantastic. Eventually we'll have to have some sort of website where people can go and actually look up and uh, how you spell boffler. Um But for the moment, thank you for your boffalas, Susie. You're <laughs> you fantastic. Do. Shall we actually go... Bang-a-bonking. Bang Shall we go bang-a-bonking? Let's do it. <sighs> if you've been enjoying this, please do rate and review us. Uh, it'll really help other listeners find out where we are for future episodes. Something Rhymes with Purple is a Something Else production. It was produced by Paul Smith with additional production from Russell Finch, Steve Ackerman and Josh Gibbs. Are you really going off to an awards do tonight? No. Oh.